when looking for the king of podcasts, you're at the wrong channel. Well, excuse me! Looking for good ideas for life? You're far from good hands. Hey, bud, what's your problem? If you think the listener is always right, you're far from the right place. Out of order! Even in the future, nothing works! Hosted by a Northeasterner by birth, but a rebel by choice. Are you threatening me? If you want a host that floats between love and madness, and we know the night is always gonna be here anyway. Thinking of you's working up my appetite, looking forward to a little afternoon delight. Then play on and listen to Crazy Train Radio. All right, guys, uh, listen to the blues riff and B. Watch me for the changes and try and keep up, okay? Warning, creators of this game do understand the subject matter may be offensive to some, but they do honor the families and people that have been affected by these real life tragedies that these individuals have caused. Wanna play a game? Oh yeah! Lover of true crime? Yes, yes, yes. Well, we got an interesting game for you to check out. Wow. With the mashup of influences such as horror movies, collecting cards, and RPGs. What? Led to giving birth to an incredible creation of this game. Killers, the card game. You are all my children now. This game is a collectible trading card game featuring some of the most infamous killers with tidbits of trivia on the back of each card to help you learn some insight to each criminal. Who the hell are you? Let's not forget, during the game, cops will be chasing you and these criminals. I'm a cop, you idiot! However, check out their website listed through all social media today, which can be found under Killers, the card game. Am I on the internet? I want to play a game. Hey everyone, this is Harrison Smith, director of Camp Dread and Death House Special and Where the Scary Things Are, and you are listening to Crazy Train Radio. Hey folks, it's your least favorite host in the podcast world, Croc, Jonathan Steele. And boy, do we have a good one for you today. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, happy to be talking to this gentleman again. And this time, or I should say the first time was about some movies and a different book but also he joined us for a charity watch along we watched death house with a running commentary with this guest but he has a new book out it's called the making of the movie leprechaun i need me gold and the guest b harrison smith harrison how are you sir great it's great to be back again john thank you very much for having me and uh I hope uh, hope you enjoyed the book. Yes, I did. And it was funny. Somebody was posting about, I don't know what this says about me, whether I wasn't paying attention or because I, the whole ADHD doing 17 things at once. Sure. Uh, somebody posted about a book they were working on and looking to get some uh, publicity and stuff. And I said, well, let's talk. And the guy was like, 
I'm not sure da, 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 at the moment, you know, just without juggling everything, getting things set. He goes, but I know a guy who's got a new one out and it was you. And of course it was, I'm like, okay. Cause it was from your personal Facebook profile uh, for, you know, with the B and all that fun stuff. I, I didn't put two and two together. Oh, okay. Yeah. That sounds cool. I like Leprechaun and this, that, yeah, let's do it. Set sure. it up. Uh, and I'm like, Oh shit, that's you know Harrison. I yeah, you know, I didn't put two two. It was funny when it clicked. I'm like, hey, dope. Yeah, that's you know Harrison. You know, sure, sure. So, it was all good, and I'm glad we're doing it. So first and foremost, uh, with the book, why go in depth about this uh, movie? Because it's a it's an interesting movie to, especially from the time period, and even still to this day, it's well liked, but. Why did you go this direction for talking about it in a book? Sure. Uh, well, the publisher um, at Bear Manor Media is a big Orlando, fan. Florida, great group. Yeah, yeah, they are. They are a terrific group. Uh, he's a particular fan of not just even the first one, but the the franchise itself. And he said, you know, I'd love to see a, a definitive book on the making of of Leprechaun and. At first, they asked for like, you know, the whole series. And as I started digging and going into writing Leprechaun, uh, I found that there, there just wasn't really a lot to talk about with the sequels. I mean, if people enjoyed them, fine. But Mark Jones and David Trippett and people like that really didn't have anything to do with the sequels at all. And I found that as it came together and how Mark Jones fought and, and always took advantage of of opportunities throughout his life from high school all the way on through that I felt that the original Leprechaun was the real story. The, the sequels are just kind of like, yeah, well, then there were some sequels and this happened on set, but there, it, it didn't have the, the cohesive kind of uh, story that, that the original film has and how so many disparate people were brought together and that this film was originally slated to be a video release. And then when uh, Mark Amin and, and the executives, the suits at Trimark, saw where this was going, um, they took a gamble. And, and they really took a hell of a gamble on giving this movie a, the wide theatrical release that it got. And if you remember in the book, uh, I, I opened it with when I was running the movie theater as a manager going, this movie looks awful and it's never going to make any money. And my other manager was like, nope, I'm booking it in the biggest house. And I think it's going to do too. Yeah, theater too. And uh, son of a bitch, it turned out that this thing made money. And it made money all across the nation. And uh, turned out to be Trimark's most profitable, you know, right out of the bat, out of the gate kind of thing. And, and also, I think to date, it's most profitable franchise. So... It was about a lot of people that that came together that had Mark Jones's back. Um, there were a lot of people against him that had sharpened knives against him that, that were like they, they wanted him to fail. Uh, they did not want to see him succeed. Uh, he had to constantly prove himself throughout almost all of the making of the movie uh, with even it coming down to this uh, uh, mediation at Mark Amin's house where his so-called, I'll, I'll call them enemies, even though they were just really doubters, were gathered where Mark Amin said, no, I, I, I like the way this is going. It, I think Mark Jones has it and we're going to keep going in this direction. So no, we're not, we're not swapping Mark out. We're not getting rid of him. We're not going to put in a, another pinch hitter for you know a director. And um, the sequels just really don't have that. So I, I came back to the publisher and said that the story is Leprechaun because if the film were made today, it would not get a theatrical release. It would probably get, well, like the recent one did, some kind of sci-fi channel, you know, release, a streaming release, and, and that would be it. The movie came out at just the right time, and it came out at the time when arguably the home video market had peaked. And they were at peak home video where they knew that even if the movie doesn't do well theatrically, we can make that up in video cassette sales. We, and DVD still wasn't here yet. So they, they knew 
they knew that it was almost a sure thing. It, it depended on how much they had to spend to put it in theaters. And as you read, you know, right toward the end, they, they kept test marketing it and they test marketed it in this market. Then they moved it to another couple cities and another market and it kept doing well. And they, they kept thinking at first that this just can't be right. It, it, it just can't be testing this well. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying the movie is the greatest movie ever made. It's not The Thing. It's not uh, Fright Night. It's, it's not anything like that. But it is this little movie that could. And it really showed what happened when Mark had a vision. He had a vision of making this not so much a family-friendly horror film, but this film that would eventually appeal to kids, which it did. That You might call Leprechaun almost the first multi-level marketing horror film because when they trimmed it for TV screenings, the kids loved it. Like kids went nuts. They liked the Leprechaun. And most of all, they had Warwick Davis. And you, you probably are going to ask me somewhere along the line of, you know, why didn't you interview Warwick? And uh, the, the real answer to that is, I don't think Warwick had anything more to say other than what was already definitive in his autobiography. He said everything that needed to be said about the making of Leprechaun. And he was shooting Willow at the time I was doing all the interviews. And um, I just didn't feel like, I mean, what's he going to say? I mean, what's he going to say other than what Mark Jones is telling me, David Trippett's telling me, uh, Mark Holton's telling me. It's going to be almost the same thing. And plus, he, he gets interviewed on Leprechaun all the time. So for me, it was like, I'm, I'm not going to just basically lift whatever he has in his autobiography and just transfer it over to my book. I wanted to hear from the filmmakers. Um, I did get uh, Ken Olin. I, I did get um, Mark uh, Holton. I, I did get those people. Uh, there are a lot of Marks and Davids in, in the making of this film. But I, I wanted their points of view because we had Mark Holton, who was coming off fresh as a big 80s icon from Pee Wee and Teen Wolf and all those films. And we had Ken Olin, uh, who, you know, was kind of known as like the horror hunk at the time, starred opposite of Jennifer Aniston and, uh, you know, went on to have another career outside of producing and all of that stuff as well, too, and a family. So I wanted him to do the foreword. Because I really feel that a lot that, you know, Ken Olin got overlooked a lot in the making of Leprechaun. And uh, getting to Jennifer Aniston just wasn't going to happen. Um, and even while I was writing it, she said something in the press again about it and made it clear that, you know, she has no interest in discussing Leprechaun. I don't know why the woman treats it like she did porn or something like that. It's not... I don't understand why she thinks it's such a black mark or something to be embarrassed about. The movie launched her. Uh, she rolled right from that into Friends. And um, she has, I mean, she did a great performance. She's not naked in the movie. Uh, there are no sex scenes with her. There's nothing for her to go. Shame. Shame. Oh, I'm really embarrassed about that. Like that was raunchy or... There's nothing like that other than, you know, it's a silly horror film. No, it's it's no masterpiece. And Mark Jones made it clear that he, he didn't set out to do that. He set out to make a fun horror movie. And I think that's what we got. Yes. And there's a lot to unpack there. But it's funny that you mentioned about Jennifer Aniston's comments. And for those that know me, know I am a huge Howard Stern fan. Hey, now. I don't know if it's because I'm from the Northeast and such. Sure. But, you know, the guy does great interviews and yes. he had, he's evolved and most people still look at the sleaze, whatever, you know, those parts of the show, but a man's evolved. But anyway, he had Jennifer in studio, I guess it would have been 2019, right before COVID hit when he was visiting the LA studios and he brought up leprechaun to her mm -hmm. you know doing his due diligence and stuff and she kind of it was like rolled my eyes yeah it's it is what it is and all that fun stuff like i can't like you know some people you know enough people in the business like i do that it when sometimes pro, pro, previous projects of theirs comes on 
they might sit and watch it for a few minutes or whatever. She said she was adamant, hey, I try to bypass Leprechaun. I try to forget Leprechaun that yep. whole bit. But she told a story about a boyfriend at the time was over and they happened, you know, they were watching TV, nothing major. And it came on. Oh, wait, that's you. Yeah, like he didn't put it and he wanted to insist on watching the movie, but she couldn't. But who knows? Yeah, I, I don't understand. I mean, everybody's got their thing, I guess. Um, for me, it just I, I just don't understand why it's a, a source of embarrassment when, you know, quite frankly, she's made some outright awful motion pictures that I would be much more embarrassed about than Leprechaun. But um I, I guess, I mean, I don't know. I, we, I did make the attempt. I did reach out. I did reach out to her publicist. I did reach out to her agency. Um, Mark Jones even tried as well. And uh, she just politely declined. And that's her prerogative. Uh, I didn't write any. There's nothing to write negative about her. No, um, no, not at all. It's her choice. You know, it's it's just simply, you know, I just think it's much ado about nothing. I I, I don't understand why. She just feels the way that she does about the film when, when again, there are other things I would probably shy away from and be like, yeah, well, it was a paycheck than, than this. And I mean, I've enjoyed her work. I don't think she's a bad actress. I don't think no. anything like that. Just, um, I, again, it's her prerogative. I, yeah. I tried to get her. That's all I can say. You mentioned Ken, who played Nathan, who did the yeah. forward in the book. And it's funny that, when he apparently was reached out to, did you reach out to him directly or was it through his like agent and stuff? No, I like reached that? out directly to him. Okay. Cause he tells the story of being reached out to and like, yeah, thinking yeah it was David just some Trippett, sort of, yeah. David Trippett reached out to him. David, David still stayed in touch with him. And he said, you know, do you want any of the stars? And I said, well, obviously Jennifer Aniston. Um, but he said, well, you know, I stay in touch with Ken Olin. You know, how about, uh, would you want to talk to him? So I started talking to Ken and I reached out. I said, look, I'm writing this book. I'd love to have your input. And he's, you know, we, it evolved into, well, how would you like to write the foreword uh, to the book? You know, I mean, when you're writing these things, what, what people don't understand is like, I, I've seen uh, reviews on other books of making of books. And, you know, there are some reviewers that are like, you know, I talked to so-and-so and, they don't have any memories. They don't remember anything. And it's like, well, they really don't because they're in the thick of it. They're, they're memorizing their lines. They have to hit their marks. They may be shooting in, in difficult conditions, weather wise or whatever, where there just isn't time to remember all these things that we think they have time to remember. And I found that out in writing my book on the making of the last dinosaur where Joan Van Ark, I was asking her all these questions about her and Richard Boone and, you know, all, all the other actors. And she's like, honey, it was a thousand years ago. And most of all, we were fighting against the elements. And it was like when they yelled action, you do your thing and you do your thing the best you can. And there just wasn't a lot of time to either interact. And if we did, we just didn't have a lot of time to socialize and remember. So Ken kind of echoed those same things. He said the same thing that, you know, we were like in the thick of everything. It was it was cold at times up there and we were under inhospitable conditions. Sometimes we fell behind. We had to move fast. So when you always ask, well, were there funny moments on set? A lot of it, it's a common thing with with actors where they say, I, I really I don't remember a lot. And they're not lying and they're not they're not trying to be difficult. They, they really don't. They don't remember a lot because they're in the thick of it. They're in the middle of, like I said, hitting their marks, taking their direction, doing all their things. Now, if something big happens, that's a different story. But overall, um, but overall, no. They so I that's why I also, you know, I, I started talking to him about it. And when he started saying that, I'm like, I was working simultaneously on the, the dinosaur book. And I thought, well, you know, how would you like to write the foreword? And uh, he jumped at that. He was like, Yeah, I'd love to. And uh, because he felt that, you know, the book was very, or the movie was, was a very um, fortunate thing for him and that, you know, it, it gave him a career. It, it gave him a, a launch pad. And uh, he's very positive 
on on the movie. And um, unlike Jennifer, but he didn't have anything bad to say about Jennifer. He said, you know, he he echoed similar things like, again, I, I don't know why she's so down on the film, but hey, that's her thing. And she went on to obviously have a very robust career. So um, he just did his thing. Well, it was definitely well put in his forward. Yeah, I uh, think so. You, you uh, mentioned about earlier, and like I said, there was a lot to unpack mm-hmm. of the movie being booked in theater too at the theater you were assistant manager of and you weren't sure of things and yet it turned out well Mm -hmm. but and you for those who don't know who didn't listen to the other episode or watch along and anything like that you are well versed besides being a writer and director the other book i was looking for when you came into the room was this time it's personal a monster's kid history of our memories and experiences. So yeah. obviously I think you're well qualified to speak on this topic, but what was it for you when you actually sat down and watched the movie that you go, Hey, this isn't as bad as I thought it may have been. What stood out for you when you, when you look at the actual final product? Sure. I, I think what really stood out to me was the quality of the movie. Um, I was expecting, you know, like really, just really bad stuff. And it was well shot. It was well composed. The cinematography was good. Uh, in fact, very different than what I expected. It, it, it had a lot of Beetlejuice to it, which I was surprised. Um, I was kind of, I, I think what really impressed me was, is they took it seriously enough. They knew they had a silly kind of monster, a leprechaun. Um, but Warwick brought some real gravitas to it. I mean, he really did. I mean, he sold it and under Mark's, you know, directorial hand, um, they put in just the right amount of satire and tongue in cheek, but also kept it serious enough that, okay, we're playing for keeps here. The thing is biting people's fingers off and it's, it's doing all this other stuff. So, okay. It's not hokey. Um, and we had good performances. I mean, look, we had, you know, we had Francis Buxton in it, right? We, we had, we had some people in there that were taking it seriously. And, and the girl I watched it with just drooled all over Ken Olin. So it was like, you you, you know what I mean? Like the quality was all there. Here's the bottom line. You could tell it was made by people who gave a shit. That's, that's what it was because it could have easily been made by people who just didn't fucking care. And just made something stupid and threw it out there. Everybody cared. And that's what really shows up on the film. Is it the greatest horror film ever made? No. And Mark Jones will tell you that himself. He knows that. He made what he wanted to make. He made a crowd-pleasing film. And it worked. That's where I think the sequels went off the rails. Because there was no firm directorial vision for the sequels. Mark had a vision. David Trippett knew also, like I wrote in there, when when Trippett said, okay, we we read Mark's script and they passed on it the first time because, look, you you either make it one thing or the other. You can't make it a family horror film or you you just make it a horror film. Like, But you can't have both. You got to tip the scales one way or or the other. And David Trippett was right. And then, you know, you brought in David Price who was there to really look over Mark's shoulder, Mark Jones's shoulder. You know, he did just did, you know, Children of the Corn 2 and all of that stuff. So, and Price, of course, had a long pedigree with, with his father. So, you know, the, all, the, all the things were there. Like the studio also cared that it was a good movie. They, they weren't going to blow their load on, on this shitty film because they knew they'd pay for it in the end. If it's really bad, it's not even going to sell video cassettes because remember blockbuster and them, they still order units. And if, if they thought the movie was bad, they're not going to order incredible amounts of units of these tapes. They're not going to do it. So the theatrical really helped the video release um, because they knew, you know, they, they knew they had something good. And that was my reaction watching it in the theater that night. I'm like, wow, this doesn't stink like I thought it was going to stink. I, I underestimated this movie. Well, you brought it up about the uh, 
videotapes and all that stuff. And Trimark was looking to start distribution at the time. And that's one of the yep. main things they wanted to get behind this project with. Mm-hmm. And it was a budget, if I remember correctly, $900,000. Yeah, it's it was Just, right around there. Yes. Yeah. And it would have been closer to two million in today's money, all that fun stuff. Mm-hmm. But you mentioned about the today's standards with it might not make the theaters and even much more of a f- huge financial risk to put that style of film in the theaters and such. But was it the right place, right time? Because of from a technological standpoint because obviously video cassettes were a big thing at the time where today we have dvds blu-rays you have streaming sure. just because of what are you looking at from that lens that where we're at 2023 where we intake our entertainment yeah i'm definitely looking at it from that perspective we we're, we're looking back at a time when you know pretty much vhs was it and dvd was just coming around Laser we had laser disc. We had laser disc and all that, but let's face it, laser disc never caught on the way the VHS did. What? 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 Uh, it wasn't like you know you walked into your friend's house and they had a laser disc player. I mean, you might have had one, but it's not like if you went to all of your friends' houses in the eighties or the nine early nineties, um, they all had laser disc players. They were more of a, a niche kind of technology for real, you know, uh, cinemaphiles is really what it was. Um, But everybody had a VCR pretty much. So yeah, looking at it from the perspective now and, and, you know, look what we're dealing with now with physical media, which is a shame. Hard media, physical media should never go away simply because of the fact that you can go back and edit things and change things. So in, in 10, 15 years, right, there you go. That's everybody should have a library of DVDs of their favorite films because look what they just recently tried to do with the French connection. They, they edited a supposedly racially insensitive piece of material out of the film. And I don't care what you want to call it. That's censorship. If, if you're watching a movie about heroin trafficking and you're going to be upset by a racial epithet, then you don't belong watching that goddamn movie in the first place. If you're that sensitive and all that is, is censorship. And it's under the guise of we're going to cut this out uh, for your own good. No movies should be altered. And how do we know what's going to happen in 10, 15 years from now? Look, we have generations growing up now. They, they think the original Halloween is Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yeah. Okay, so they, they don't even know about all this stuff. So if you change it, how do you even know? They, they've already, they, they tried to do that with Titanic and James Cameron went after him. They've, they've tried to do things. Uh, South Park, they've done it with South Park on, on streaming. What's the big deal? It doesn't hurt anybody. Fuck, 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 fuck. Um, that's censorship. And physical media should never go away because it is a permanent record that is unalterable. And I, I fear the streaming becoming the norm because in the future we can just go back and change things and alter that original content. So, yes, I'm looking at it through that perspective of if it were released today, there's so much content now that it would just get lost in the shuffle and no no distributors going. I mean, there were no major stars in it. Everybody thinks Jennifer Aniston. This was before Jennifer Aniston was Jennifer Aniston. OK, so no, it doesn't count. Um, there, there were no there was no star power like, a you know, a, I don't know, a Tom Hanks or whatever there. There was no one in this that would justify spending twenty five to fifty thousand dollars per screen each week to keep this thing up on the screen for a theatrical release. It wouldn't work. You'd stream it and it would just go out there and and it might make a sequel or two. I don't know. I I don't know. We're we're coming out of the 80s also as well. Leprechaun still has that 80s feel. It has the 80s lighting sometimes in the background. The forest is lit with that you know, spotlight behind the tree thing with the haze and the fog, you know, and um, we're still in 80s mode. And for me, Leprechaun felt like an 80s movie in many ways, but also with a lot of Tim Burton in it. And and I believe I mentioned in the book that, you know, they, I think Ken Olin said something about it as well, that, you know, they, they wanted to make a Disney horror film, 
right? And I think Mark Jones succeeded. I think he succeeded exactly with what he wanted to do on that. But today, no, I, I don't think he would get a theatrical, just like I think if the original Halloween were released today, I think it would get a PG-13 rating, maybe even a PG rating, and uh, it would stream. I, I don't see it. I don't see it getting a theatrical at all. Last question when it comes to the book. And sure. you kind of danced around this a little bit. Well, not danced, but I'll ask directly because it, I think you would know about this. Talked about PG horror versus R horror and taking a stance as which direction you're going to go when making a project. And obviously Mark Jones was involved as both writer and director for this project. Does that help with the vision of a project? Because obviously you have that background as well with, well, a director has one view, but you know, for somebody else's writing, but he was the writer. So he goes, no, this is the vision for this project. This is the direction I want to go. Does that help? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Having a strong directorial vision and knowing, and, and again, I think Mark was assisted by David Trippett, who also said that too. Like, you either got to have it one way or another. You know, you're either going to go balls the wall and make a horror film here and put some real horror elements in it, or you're going to make a family film. But you can't have it both ways. So the battle for PG-13 and R uh, was a substantial one because even today, I don't care what Fangoria says. I don't care what any of them say. Ho true horror audiences still hesitate at PG-13 horror. They, they do hesitate at it, and it can affect box office. Now, the opposite can also be, too. I remember that you know Universal fretted when Jaws 2 was being edited. They were worried about getting an R rating because they felt that an R rating, and this is before PG-13, but they felt an R rating would kill the box office performance of Jaws 2. So they looked very carefully at the death of the uh, helicopter pilot and Marge uh, when she's knocked off the boat. And they even cut a death uh, with the character of Bob, which the shark, you know, killed him. And um, they were worried about that. So my, my answer is, uh, yes, you know, the, I think the strong directorial vision of Mark Jones uh, backed up with David Trippett's common sense because David Trippett was the dollar and cents guy. He was the guy that if this movie tanked, he was also going to be left holding the bag as well, too. I mean, the studio looked at David Trippett and said, we're trusting you too. make sure this guy doesn't screw it up. And uh, Trippett never felt that there was any danger of Mark Jones screwing it up. However. Uh, Trippett originally in the very beginning in, in the uh, discussion process uh, made it clear that you have to have a monster that's either going to be one thing or another. He can't be adorable and still kill people. So he could be funny and still kill people, but you can't have a family film and still kill people. So what's it going to be? And I think Mark Jones listened um, and I think, you know, achieved the right it had the right balance of humor and uh, gore, just enough. It just did it right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, I'll have links to the book through Amazon and all that stuff. Pick up hard copies, uh, bearmanormedia.com as well. But mm -hmm. curious to know, because there's you touched on there, there's some other things you touched in the book that I found mm -hmm. interesting, and I didn't get a chance to talk to you about last time, I don't believe. But one of the big things that stood out was filmmaking fundamentals because mm -hmm. obviously there are in today's world in 2023 all kinds of contact behind the scenes fan sites uh, but and you were talking about the process of making a movie is both simple but complicated could you yes. talk about that a little bit sure i mean most people think making a movie is just simple you set up some cameras and people come on and they act you have some special effects, you shoot it, you edit it, you put it out. It is a gigantic wedding is what it is. There is the preparation, there is the execution, and then there is the follow-up. And uh, most people don't understand that. That's why I, I listed all of that. And I gave the very basics in the book. Do you have this? Do you have a proper crew in place? Do you have a director of photography? Do you have a good sound person? 
Um, do you do you have, for example, if you don't have a good DP, and and it's not just about lighting. DPs are more than just lighting something. They're about shooting things properly and also making sure the focus is proper. People don't even realize that. If you don't have a good uh, uh, second AC that's going to pull focus and all of that, I mean, you could shoot all day long and then get it into the editing room and realize it's blurry. And there's no amount of CGI that's going to fix that. So do you have your catering all set up? How are you feeding your crew? How, how are you, are you going to have a catering table, a craft table, they call it? Uh, what about allergies? What about actors with allergies? What about crew with allergies? What uh, what can they eat? What can't they eat? Some are vegetarian, some are vegan, some are not. All these things. And you have your lactose intolerant. Um, or with special effects and lighting. What if you have strobe lights? Do, are any of your actors or crew epileptic? Like you have to think of everything. It's more than just, we're going to put some people together and make a movie. And then do you have all the proper money? Do you have things in place to get the effects that you want? Uh, you know, you can write. The number one thing I see in, in amateur scripts is the idea that they're, you know, they're writing for low budget. They have a low budget, but they're writing for like A-list, you know, action. Like, you know, I just taught a class recently. Um, of, I, I was asked to come in and teach like this basic high school filmmaking workshop for like three days. And, you know, the, these these students are just like, OK, well, we want to have this car chase scene and, and the person gets hit by a car. I'm like, well, number one, are we closing the streets? Because that costs money for permits and you need police to supervise. Two, who's paying for the liability insurance on that? Three, who's rigging all the stunts? And four, where are you getting the stunt cars? Well, we'll just use someone's car. And if you dent the car, if you chip the paint on the car, well, that won't happen. You don't know that. So you now have introduced an expensive stunt into your story that costs money. Who's, how are you covering it? Are you fixing GoPros to everything? Who's got GoPros? If not, are you going to put a film tray on the side of the car? Are you putting a harness and a rig on the front of the car to get the action shots that you need? Is someone going to rollerblade or, you know, a hoverboard next to the car to get the shot? You're going to get a drone. What are you going to do? All of this. And, and when I was done doing all this, I repeated what's in the book. They just sat there staring at me like, I can't believe all of this goes into making a movie. And it's like, yeah, the movies make it look easy. And especially now with digital technology and CGI. And now you can download free video editors for your computer and all that stuff. Oh, it's just easy. And no, no, it's not. No, it's not. If it's really easy, then you're doing something wrong then you're not making a good film is really what it is. Um, it is hard. It's, it's hard from beginning to end. And also that means how do you cast it? Are you casting the right people? Are they good actors? Are they bad actors? Um, directing it. What do you want? You can direct it a million different ways, but you also have a budget and you are shooting it on a time schedule. So Mark Jones knew that too. I think they had 20 some days, maybe three weeks to shoot this thing, three and a half weeks. You're not going to get some of the things you want. So you've got to rewrite things. You've got to reevaluate things and look at stunts and, and special effects. What if the special effect doesn't go off right? Do you keep doing it? Do you keep trying it? Because every time you do that effect, it's money. Eventually you're going to go over budget. And studios don't like to go over budget. And Mark Amin made that clear. And David Trippett made that clear to Mark Jones. You're not getting any extra money. So shoot this thing right the first time because we're not going back and fixing things. We're not going back and, and giving you more money and run this thing over budget. So in the book, I cover all of those things all the way from the beginning to the end. What happens if you get into post-production and your sound guy only recorded in mono or there was interference and he didn't hear it and you have nothing but staticky on your sound and now you have to do ADR, which is alternate dialogue recording. Now you got to find your actors, get them to an audio studio to re-loop their lines. You got to pay for a studio. You got to do all of these things. It's like, again, you go to a wedding, all you know is you show up 
you watch the wedding, it looks beautiful, you eat the food, you eat the cake, you drop your present off and you go home. Well, that's like a movie, right? You go to the movies, you watch, you get your popcorn, you pick your seat, you watch the movie and you leave and you discuss it. Then you go online and you trash it and shit talk it uh, because you had nothing to do with it. You didn't work on it. You didn't put your heart and soul into anything. Uh, That's what the line is in my movies uh, where the scary things are, where the one kid says, you know, it's the internet. Everybody shits all over everything because it's real easy to do that now. It's easy to, to get on Amazon and give it one star and say, oh, this sucked without even knowing all that goes into it. And that's what I wanted with this book was to start out by showing that this little tiny horror film with a $900,000 budget took over a year to plan. And Mark Jones was writing it since 1986. So it wasn't just like they got together and said, hey, let's make a movie about a leprechaun killing people. Like it, it was a huge effort to make this little film. And that's what I wanted for the book to get across. And from what I've uh, gotten back from people, including the director himself, Mark Jones, is that it reads very much like a, a filmmaking handbook that here's what you need to do to make a movie. And those things still apply today. The filmmaking process has not changed. Yeah, you have some CGI now and digital effects and some things are a little easier. Uh, but overall, you still got to put that crew together. You still got to put that cast together. And until AI completely takes it all over, which I feel is inevitable, um, you still got to do it the old fashioned way. So whether it's 1991 or it's 2023, it doesn't matter. So obviously I'll touch on that there. And I don't know how much you can discuss or not discuss. Obviously what's been in the news with the entertainment world is both sure. writers and the SAG is on strike. So how does that, and obviously part of the topic is the, what you mentioned there, AI and such. Yes. So what are your thoughts coming from a writer director perspective? Cause obviously the directors guild recently came to an agreement on things. I don't know if you're in there, but then. No, I, I, I'll tell you what, I have deliberately stayed out of the guilds for this very reason. Um, I've been offered to join the Directors Guild and the Writers Guild, and I have declined. Um, The reason why, actually, to answer your question, I can just email it to you. I wrote a 19-page paper, an open letter to SAG and the Writers Guild of America, telling them that this is more than just about streaming and residuals. This is about the future of entertainment together. This strike is going to be one of the last stands of human beings in the entertainment field, because we are poised for a major revolution. And outside of five to 15 years, and don't hold me to that, it could be sooner, um, artificial intelligence is going to take it all over. And that's what the studios want. So I, I said in my open letter that if I were the head of SAG, if I were Fran Drescher right now, I would be doing more than trying to get some scraps from the table on residuals so that the studios can throw me some crumbs and go, okay, go back to work now. We're all good, right? Because while we do all that, we're still developing the software behind the scenes to take over all your jobs. Just so you know, we're looking for the perfect AI program to write the perfect screenplay that checks off every box office smash box that we can get so we don't have to pay writers. We want to develop, look, you, if you saw The Flash recently, Whether the CGI was good or bad, the intent is there. We saw Christopher Reeve as Superman again. We saw George Reeves as Superman. We saw Helen Slater in full humanoid figure, and it's almost there. It's not 100% yet. But eventually, one day, you're going to have an Indiana Jones who is Harrison Ford that will never age. And you can go see a James Bond movie with whatever James Bond you want. If you want Sean Connery back, it'll be with Sean Connery and they will never age and they will never get sick and they won't sexually harass their co-stars and create lawsuits and situations. They will never retire. Uh, They won't take residuals. They won't do any of that. That's what the studios are really looking for, man. And before people go, that's not true. Everybody wants the human element. The human element. Really? Have you watched The Flash? 
Have you watched the last handful of Avengers movies? Really? A computer could write all of them. What's in those things that a computer can't do? And they're all animated anyway. With The Flash, I sat there watching it going, why the hell are we even making live action superheroes anymore? It's all animated. It's all CGI and green screen anyway. So just make it an animated thing. Why do we have actors in this? It's stupid. Like you've, you've taken it from way back when we made like, you know, Adam West's Batman where there were no digital effects and you have actors running around in pretty cheesy costumes. And through the seventies when we had our Spider-Man and our Captain America who was riding a, a chintzy Suzuki motorcycle or Yamaha, whatever it was, um, and wearing a, a bike, a motorcycle helmet, um, to now where we've, we've just gone three, you know, is it 360? Because then, then we'd be going back. So we've done a 180, and that is now everything's CGI. You know, the only thing that was that held it back in the flash was that Christopher Reeve didn't talk. And for some reason in Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, um, I don't know why they didn't do it, but they went through all this trouble to de-age him, and it looked fantastic. And anybody who says it didn't, you don't know movies because that's Academy Award winning special effects right there. However, when he opened his mouth, he sounds like 82 year old Harrison Ford. And I don't understand why they didn't clean up the voice. I I don't get that. Or even have another actor do the voice that sounded like Harrison Ford 40 years ago. I don't understand why they didn't do that because they surely could have. It's within their purview to do it. It's technologically possible to do it. So we're, we're almost there. I mean, the last Godzilla movie, Godzilla versus Kong, all it was was a two hour long Sony PlayStation game. That's all it was. The very opening looks like a, the, the splash screen, the opening, you know, a key screen to a video game. Opponent defeated, opponent defeated. What am I watching here? Am I watching PS4 or 5 or am I watching a movie? Millie Bobby Brown shows up for a few minutes, you know, does nothing but walks through and takes her paycheck. And Kyle Chandler, who was all set up to take over for Dr. Sarazawa from the previous film, is basically watching video screens of Godzilla breaking shit through the movie, saying Godzilla's turned bad and we don't know why. What are we doing here? So don't tell me we need the human element to write these things. Computers will never write them. We're already seeing it. Because if humans are at the end of Indiana Jones, four people to write the Dial of Destiny. Oh, my God. Four people to write that thing. It was it wasn't a great script at all. And and you're looking at it going, I'm sitting in a gigantic crowded theater watching this and not a single applause. No one yelling and shouting or applauding or laughing. It was dull. It was a dull movie. Harrison Ford looked tired and the script was ridiculously mediocre is all it was with an ending that should have come out of something like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And it's like, really, a computer couldn't write better than this? Really? What's there to write? You know, a bunch of green screen shots. Look, we saw this starting with Jurassic World, the first one. In Jurassic World, nobody directed that. It was a laundry list of set pieces get to the island, show dinosaurs, people in danger, dinosaurs chase people, big confrontation at the end between dinosaurs. There you go. It's a laundry list. It's not a script. I was standing in line. We were waiting for the 2D version and, uh, or I was waiting for the 3D version, sorry. And there were these college guys in front of me and the, the 3D version sold out. So we had, got rolled over into the 2D version, which was starting... 10 minutes earlier, it started 10 minutes earlier. And these guys were like grumbling, oh, we just missed a movie. I I even looked at them, I said, guys, what are we really missing here? What do you think's gonna happen? We're gonna introduce some kids and lots of helicopter shots of the island with dun, 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 dun. And then we're gonna see the park and we're gonna see dinosaurs before kids get in trouble. And on the way out, this what the same, one of the same college guys stopped me, he said, dude, That's exactly what it was, what you said. I'm like, yeah, because it's just 
checking off the boxes. This isn't about screenwriting anymore. And that's what the studios are looking for. So I wrote 19 pages of an open letter to Hollywood saying to Fran Drescher and the head of the WGA, you guys better start calling a summit meeting with all the big studios to the table saying, what are we doing about the next five years? What are we doing about the next 10 years? Your actors better be calling CAA and APA and all these other ones and UTA and asking their agents, what are you doing for me other than collecting a commission? Because how am I guarding my image from being copied? Because that's what they're doing. They want to scan you and use your image later on and pay you nothing. That's what they want to do. I just had somebody who rolled over from one of my sets and went on to an A-list set that was shooting in Philadelphia and they needed extras. I think she said like 2,800 people showed up. And the one uh, showrunner there said right out, we only need 300. And when she said, but you know, there are like 3,000 people here to fill this football stadium. And the guy told her right out, we only need 300 for up front for the cameras. We'll fill in the rest. There you go. Yeah. It's coming to that. And you can tell me it's not, but it's almost like going back to the day when people said, oh, the, the talking motion picture will never last. Well, here we are. You watch <laughs> AI will take it all over and the studio execs will become tech companies. That's what they will become. The studios will become tech companies and these films will just be technological content and product. That's what they will be. And two more things. The first was, and you mentioned this in the book, the Leprechaun book, by the way, I will have links for everything, Amazon, all that fun stuff. You had some real chutzpah, as they say in Yiddish, and two different occasions in the 80s. One being calling the man from Basket Case, Frank Helen Lauder, but mm-hmm. also then also doing your college days, reaching mm-hmm. out to Heather Langenkamp. Uh, yes. To do an interview for the college paper. Yeah, well, that would be called stalking today. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> but you presented an idea for Dream Warriors. And yeah. with the different factors of Leprechaun and such, it gives me a lot of the feel of the original nightmare there. And oh, yeah. Because of it was a, I'm not knocking the original Halloween here, but I'm looking at Nightmare, the comparison, mm-hmm. because it was the start of the, really when VHS and all and beta was coming out and it was like, hey, did you see this movie? Did you see this movie? You know, things started trickling because of, I believe you said in the book that you were like, okay, cool, whatnot. But when you, you saw your friend's reactions when you rented the movie, it was like, hmm, there might be something here. And obviously two is what it is. I'm not knocking two. I know people throughout the whole series that, you know, but you, like you said that, Your friend's reaction to the first one when you rented the film, it was just, wow. Yeah. Yeah, they stole it. I mean, they didn't steal all of it. There there was stuff in there. I didn't have the mental home. I didn't have all of that. But I had a girl that could pull people into their dreams, into her dreams. Uh, I brought Nancy back because that was imperative. You had to bring her back. Um, And I had the whole concept at the end that uh, Nancy would become Freddie in the dream that Nancy was pulled into this girl's dream. And um, she, the only way to fight Freddie was to become Freddie. And uh, even though that did not happen at the end of Dream Warriors, there were elements there that were clearly lifted uh, that I sent in. And I'm not arrogant enough to think that Frank Darabont stole my ideas. I don't think that was the case at all. For, what, for whatever I think how the process happened is they hired Darabont to, to write this thing and They probably told him, hey, could you incorporate some elements? And they could have borrowed from a number of scripts that they read from other people. But the element of pulling people into the dreams, uh, I definitely wrote that. Now, I have no proof of it. People can go, yeah, and it doesn't matter. Now, I was 18 years old. Uh, I had no copyright. I had no backup to to prove this. Um, You know, what, what can I do? But I know for a fact that there were, I mean, my roommates, said that they were just like dude this this was in your script and it's like yeah i know but what can i do and the other thing i wanted to bring up was you were when we connected about setting up time to talk about this book there Mm -hmm. was you were working on a project called christmas telethon can you talk on that much or 
I can, yeah. I, I can't talk a lot about it under what uh, Lionsgate has given me stipulations upon. Uh, what I can say, it is, uh, it's a Christmas comedy. I did not direct it. Uh, Douglas Henderson uh, directed it. Uh, I uh, wrote and produced. And uh, it's with Patrick Warburton from uh, mm-hmm. Seinfeld and everything else. I mean, he's Ted, nice. family uh, guy, you know, absolutely. guy's got credentials. Um, credentials. So it's a lot of fun. It's, it's very much like... Uh, you know, a, a little bit like broadcast news meets Christmas, maybe, you know, that kind of thing. A uh, little scatterbrain, scatterbrain screwball comedy, holiday comedy, but very funny. Came out really great. And Patrick was a dream to work with. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm no different than any other guy. Joe, would you put on your hand shoes and take out the garbage? Yeah, that's what you were saying. As soon as you mentioned his name, oh, I'm working with Patrick. I'm like, oh, this has got to be. Yeah. yeah he, was, he was a as hell. pleasure. He was an absolute pleasure to work and, with. And at the time when we first started talking about doing this what, again was you were like, oh, we only chatted on a phone. We didn't get it. But obviously, since you were you said the exact same thing to me. Mm-hmm. But Mr. Harrison, thank you so much, folks. Make sure you get the I need my gold, folks. <laughs> I can't do a good work day or here. I uh, will have links to that. Thank you so much for the time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, and I wish all of your uh, listeners well. Hey there, Friday fans. We know how much you enjoy the movies. Enjoy grabbing your Friday merchandise and interacting with the Friday family, whether it be at conventions or during our particular watch-alongs. Well, when you're looking to get yourself masks, why not check out our friends over at Camp Blood Customs out of New York State and order your specific custom mask from any of the films. All orders are made specifically. Your needs and wants are. Make sure you find Camp Blood Customs on Facebook, Instagram, and all over social media and order yours today. Hey y'all, this is Adam Marcus writer and director of Jason Goes to Hell and Secret Santa. And you are taking a ride on Crazy Train Radio. Badass.